What happens when I multiply cycles per instruction by seconds per cycle? What do I get? Seconds per instruction. Okay. And if I take 1 over seconds per instruction, what do I get? Instructions per second. Instructions <laughs> per second. Or IPS. Is that anything related to million instructions per second, MIPS? It is, isn't it? It's just factor of divide by 10 to the 6. Tell me, do we know the clock cycle time for machine 1 and machine 2? Yeah. 1 over the clock rate. Or if you like, don't make that a division. Make, make that a division and make that clock rate, cycles per second, whatever. OK, great. Do we know the CPI, cycles per instruction? No, it's not given. But in part A, you should be able to calculate it for machine 1 and machine 2, CPI of A, or CPI of 1 and CPI of 2. So now you've got the two CPIs. You've got the two clock cycle times, or clock rates. You can do the multiplication. You can come up with the MIPS. One machine is faster than the other. In order to speed up the slow machine, where are we going to invest our effort? Which category of instruction is the candidate for speed up? They'll make the common case fast. So you find out what percentage of the time is spent in the slowest category and speed that one up with some hardware investment. Trim off its cycles for that instruction. Get the speed up you need. And the slow one becomes equal to the fast one. That's what the third part was asking about, OK? So not a very challenging quiz, actually. First part, piece of cake, just like the examples we did last time. Second part. How do I get instructions per second? Ajiba, if I had seconds per instruction, is there any way? Oh, yeah. Seconds per instruction and instructions per second are just converse, just inverse of each other. Is million instructions per second somehow related to instructions per second? Of course. OK, so easy quiz, easy quiz. Let's have another one soon. Get ready. Keep working on these kind of problems. These are the kind of problems that we're going to expect engineers to be able to do. All right. We're now done with chapter one, done with chapter two, done with chapter three. And that means we're done with the first part of the course. So we're going to be moving to the second part of the course, which is about how to design the hardware, which will implement Yanni Yerine Getir, the instruction set architecture that we designed. So we know what we want for software. We know what the stage is that we want the instructions to be able to be dancing around on. Now we've got to build the stage. So we've got to build the hardware, which will support an instruction set. You first choose the instruction set based upon the needs of software and the users. Then you implement a machine, which will support that instruction set. So here we go. We're going to talk about how to design a computer. First, we'll do a simple computer, and then we'll move to a more complicated computer called a pipelined computer. So we're going to design a processor, and it's going to be a single cycle processor in the beginning. Everybody remember the five classic components of a processor, uh, of a computer? We've got the processor with its control and data path. We've got the memory system. We've got input output. These are the five. One, two, three, and two parts to the processor. We're going to design a single cycle processor today. As soon as we get done with chapter four, we'll move into memory in chapter 5, I.O. in chapter 6, and then we'll go with multi-core and multi-processors in chapter 7. That's, that's where we're headed with this course. OK, now remember, we, just to review about performance, the um, performance of a machine is determined by three things. This little problem had two of them, CPI and cycle time. We also have, of course, instruction count. And all of those are important, and it's the product of all three of those that determine the overall performance. The processor design, that is the data path <coughs> and control, is going to determine the clock cycle time. Hello, right there. It's going to determine clock cycles per instruction. OK, two corners of that triangle. And it's going to determine the, <coughs> um, uh, <coughs> the target uh, architecture. It'll implement the architecture to which instructions will go. So it doesn't have a direct effect on this. 
but it's the implementation of an architecture which does have a direct effect on that. So we'll work first on single cycle processor. I think the name makes it pretty clear. It's a processor that can execute an instruction in a single cycle. In fact, it executes all instructions in a single cycle. The, that's the big advantage. CPI equals one. How many cycles per instruction? One. For category A, for category B, for category C, for all categories. They're all one cycle per instruction. Great, it's going to have a very low CPI. The problem is some instructions take a long time. That means the cycle has to be a long time. So the disadvantage is it's going to have a long cycle time. Eh. Good here, not so good here. That's the trade-off of single cycle uh, machines. Now, what we're going to have to do, of course, is understand the concept of data path and control and where the instruction and data bits are going to go. <coughs> and modern hardware organization, including clocking, combinational, sequential logic, I'm trusting that we all have that background already, um, using computer organization as an example. I think we said in CS223, and hopefully you'll remember that, a computer is just a complicated example of a digital system. A computer is just a sequential circuit, but it's a complicated sequential circuit. It's a useful sequential circuit. It's a very widely uh, implemented and widely used sequential circuit, but we're not going to create some new theory here that didn't already exist from our CS223 backgrounds. What we know about uh, combinational sequential circuits is going to completely put a boundary around what we're going to do here. It's just a big boundary, that's all. We can't go outside that theory. We're not going to upset it or altoost or have a revolution here or say, oh, get your sis or we need something more. That's the theory of all digital circuits, so therefore that's the theory of this particular fancy and important digital circuit. What we taught in 223 is everything you need to know in general. We now just need to apply it to particular applications, okay? Finite state machines and computers and graphic processors and, <coughs> and uh, digital signal processors and so on. So our idea here is that we're going to start with a simple implementation and then iterate it and uh, Im improve, its, uh, improve it by also <coughs> add to its complexity. Okay, look at some of the kind of things that we're going to do to handle complexity. All engineers need to be able to do abstraction, use commonality, multi-level interpretation of difficult uh, models in order to uh, be able to handle the complexity. Okay, so the steps in designing a processor. I'd like you to pay close attention because you're going to design a processor in uh, Project 2. Project 1 was really easy compared to Project 2 because Project 2 is you design a processor. Okay, so we're going to go through the processor design steps and I can tell you that this is the summary of what they do in Silicon Valley every time they have to have a new processor, every time they come with a new revision. They do these things, okay? So this is the state of the art as far as, I mean, simplified for undergraduates, but this is what you have to do. You first have to design your instruction set. It's assumed that when you're designing a processor, you have your ISA. So you analyze that instruction set, and from that come the data path requirements. If you don't have any multiplying in your instruction set, you don't need any multiplication hardware in your data path. If you have shifting in your instruction set, you need shifting hardware in your data path. Whatever the instruction set says you need to be able to do, that's going to determine your data path requirements. So the meaning of each instruction is going to be given by a register transfer. That means that the ISA model has to get transformed into an RTL model. RTL stands for Register Transfer Language. We did some of that in CS223, if you remember. It's a way to talk about source and destination on clock edges of how data moves from the register it was stored in to the register it's going to end up in. And maybe it's transformed along with that moving. Remember that? We covered that concept. Okay, so the idea here is you take the instructions of the ISA, each one, and you model them as register transfers. And that allows you then to analyze the full set of register transfers to see what you need as far as data path. Data path has got to include storage elements for any registers that you have at your ISA, and it's got to include uh, <coughs> the computational and uh, transfer hardware to handle the register transfers themselves. Um, it's possibly you might include even more storage elements than just the ones in the ISA. Remember, ISA model storage is visible to the programmer. It's possible we'll also need some invisible to the programmer, but necessary for the data path, extra registers as well. So the full register set is possibly more than the ISA specified register set. That's the first thing. In the data path, it's got to be able to support every single register transfer. 
You want it to shift, you want it to flip the bits, you want it to add, you want it to multiply, whatever you want it to do, your data path has to support that, and the register set has to include at least this many storage elements and maybe more. All right, that's, that's step one. Analyze the instruction set and determine your storage and your transfer, including computation as you transfer requirements. Okay. Once you've done that, you've got the requirements of your data path. Second thing is now you select the components you're going to need in your data path and you establish the clocking methodology in order to <coughs> do that and then you assemble it. That's like putting the pieces together. When you were a child, you did puzzles or you built with blocks. You had the raw materials. At this step here, we have the raw materials because this is based on that and this is based on that and this is based on that and so now it's time to put it together. So you assemble the data path which meets the RTL requirement. No, we've transformed ISA model into RTL model. Now this has to meet that. And that can be analyzed formally using computer software. You can say, does this hardware circuit and connections do this set of register transfers? Does it? Yes. Does it have the capability? Yes or no? If no, iterate until it does. Okay? That's the idea here. So you assemble the data path. What does that mean? Units and connections and timing and clocking and, and the loads and stores and all that stuff that we did in the second part of CS223, you're doing it here for your computer data path. Okay. Come on. So a data path is just a set of register transfers. Now, we haven't got anybody to control them yet. So you've got this potential you know, it's like Frankenstein. The body's there, but we need a brain to control it. So then you bolt on the head, and the head says to the body, move, yes, step, go. So now we need to do the control. And the last two steps are uh, the control. So let's look at those. You now analyze the implementation of every instruction in the uh, uh, instruction set architecture to determine the setting of the control points. That means when does it happen and what control signal is needed to make it happen that effect, that's not affect, that's effect. That's yerne get terer, chelish terer, yap terer, that effect the register transfer, that cause the register transfers. You've got to find them all. For every single register transfer, you analyze it, you figure out what control it's needed. We call these control points. Okay? So you assemble the control signals or little groups of control signals necessary. This needs a two-bit control signal. This needs a single bit. This needs another single bit. Here's a four-bit control needed for my ALU. You get those control points and you pull them together and you now assemble the control logic necessary to do the control. You name the signals in four, you design the circuit in five. The circuit might be combinational. It might be a sequential circuit with a state machine. Depends on how you're trying to implement your control. Great. One, two, three did the data path. Four, five did the control unit. Now, the RTL data path and the RTL control design are simply refined. Refined means iterate, come back again, look at it again, change, tune, fix, change, tune, fix, in order to do what? To track the physical design and the functional validation. As you do physical design, you find errors in your simulation and testing. As you do functional validation, you find out, oops, we missed that, let's fix this. So basically, you make changes for timing and fixing bugs and things like that. The amount of work is going to vary with the capability of your CAD tools. Powerful CAD tools will get it right the first time or have fewer reiterations than less powerful CAD tools and also the degree of optimization that you're trying to make between cost and performance. If you want low cost, you're probably going to have less performance. You're willing to have it cost more, you can get better performance. So you're tuning the architecture of this processor, both control and data, to get what you want in this area using powerful tools, fixing the bugs you made, working with the time as it evolves of the physical circuit. So this looks simple, but actually you get the idea once you've got a first pass, now five, or sorry, six is an iterative process. Okay? Well, that's what we've got to do. And what I'm going to show you how to do now in designing a single cycle processor for MIPS is step one, two, three, four, and five. We're going to walk through steps one, two, three, and four, and five together today, or if time allows. Okay? That's our goal. Any questions about the process of designing a processor? Wow. Gee whiz. You don't have to go to Stanford or MIT or Caltech to design a CPU. No, you don't. A lot of people design processors all the time. Only a few sell in the millions and make it in the mar commercial marketplace.
But I can tell you at every processor company, there's plenty of designs. Most of them end up in the trash can or part of them it's, ends up in the final one that's commercialized. People design processors all the time. It's not an impossible thing. You don't have to be a god to design a processor. Come on, don't be scared. You guys are Bill Ken engineers, okay? So project two, you're going to design a processor. No, it's, not, it's no big deal. Okay? All right. Now, we're going to look at a subset of the instructions because this is a pedagogical example just to illustrate the process. So we're not going to design a 50 instruction uh, processor. We're going to take a subset of, of instructions. So we're going to choose the subset of instructions wisely to be representative of the class of instructions. So each one will be a member of a class. So we're going to uh, focus on a subset of the MIPS instructions. We'll take a couple of memory instructions, load word and store word. Okay? Well, that's not byte, that's not half word. No, it's not. It's just those two out of the group of memory instructions. Arithmetic. Let's add, let's subtract, let's and, let's or immediate. That gets us an immediate instruction. And let's sh shift less than. Sorry, set less than. So that allows me to do the, uh, the branches that are um, inequality branches. Okay, just five out of a big set of arithmetic instructions. What's that? 10%, maybe 20%? It's okay. There's not much difference between add and subtract and 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 or with immediate. And add immediate is represented by, you know, if I can add and I can do an immediate, then I can do an add immediate. So we don't need all combinations. And then branching, we'll take a BEQ. Once I've done that, BNE is just the terse branching. That's no big deal. And I'll take J. Once I can jump, I can do JR and JAL and the other jumps as well. So we'll just basically a small set. Two, five more, seven, eight, nine instructions. That's going to be our goal. Nine instructions out of the many that MIPS offers. So the example in the book does OR, but the lecture example in these slides is going to do OR immediate in order to get an immediate, because that's a category of instruction that we want to be sure to, to include. And the method of implementing all the other instructions should come very naturally from this group of nine. So once you see how to do these nine, you'll get the, you'll get the idea. And just very briefly, every year on the midterm and every year on the final, we ask questions about, please show how to implement an instruction. So watch close. Give you some more points on the final and the midterm. OK, now just for a quick review about MIPS, because we've been away from its kind of ISA for a while. We did its ISA early in Chapter 2, and then we've been all over the place in Chapter 2 and Chapter 3 since then, and back to Chapter 1 for performance. It might be good to do a review of the MIPS uh, format. So let's remember that our format is something like this. You know, the command followed by the destination register, one of the source registers, and the other source register. And the order is destination then sources, but in the actual instruction for the R format, it's not that way. It's source, source, destination. Right? Remember that? Yeah, just so you remember that the order of the machine instruction is not the same as the order of the assembly instruction. Okay? And there's a shift amount field here, which only comes into play if this is shift, and we're not doing shift in this little simple example, so that's not going to concern us. But you do remember that for R types, we use the zero code here and say which one it is way over here in the function field. But for the I type and the J type, the code here tells us what to do. And we're using these bits for something else. Remember that? OK, that's kind of the quick. Remember this format here? OK. All right, any questions about the R format and the arithmetic type instructions? OK, so OR is going to be like this. Set less than is going to be like this. Um, but OR immediate won't be like this because it's an immediate. So it'll be an I type. Okay. Now, for the I format instructions, load word and store word, of course, are I format. And BEQ is an I format. And ORI. Remember, there's three different kinds that use the I format. The branches use it, the memory instructions use it, and the immediates use it. So we've got both arithmetic and logic intermediates. In immediates. We've got the branching instructions, and we've got the ones that go to memory. They all need this format of <coughs> one register a second register, and a 16-bit field. So sure enough, that's what we got. After the opcode, one register, second register, and 16-bit field. RS is obviously still my source. So RT now is the destination. RT is the destination. Now be a little bit careful here. When I do this load, it means get it out of memory using this and put it there. Okay. But when I do this store, it says get it out of there 
and put it into memory here. So in a way, that's the source, but it's still called RT. In other words, we use this one to help calculate the address along with this offset. That's the address. In a load, it's going to go from that memory into here. From store, it's going to go from that register into the memory. Just remember that the arrow changes on one instruction. The store word doesn't flow that way. It flows that way. If you just can remember that one thing, you won't be fooled by the format of store word. And then the branch if equal, as everybody knows, it just compares these two and decides if we're going to take the branch or not. And this is the clue to where we're going to go. Remember, it's PC relative. So I either add this amount if it's positive or subtract this amount if it's negative. And that tells me if I branched forward or branched back. But I won't branch unless these two are equal. If I don't meet the condition, I just go on to the next instruction. And then for the or immediate, I don't need <coughs> two register sources. I need one register source and one immediate operand. And those are going to get done together to make my destination, which is going to be RT. In this case, I OR these together bitwise. You know, every bit is ORed with its corresponding position and put it in RT. So RT becomes my destination. We don't use RD anymore. What happened to RD? Oh, it's swallowed up in the 16-bit field. What we used to call RD here isn't RD anymore. It's part of immediate, part of the 16-bit immediate. Remember all that from before? Just a review. Any questions about the I format instructions? Everybody OK? All right, we're back to chapter two, the early part. How is MIPS structured? OK, finally, let's go to the J format. Remember, we had several flavors. We'll just look at one called the J instruction, jump to target. It's the go-to, you might say. It says, I'm here, but now next I'm going to be over there. So it's uh, instruction format in an assembly is J and then the target address. <coughs> and reminder here, we don't actually have the full 32-bit address available to us. What we have is a 26-bit target, so we're using what's called uh, pseudo-direct addressing. Okay, and the pseudo-direct addressing says, take this target and multiply it by 4. That means put two zeros on the end. Now you have a 28-bit number. Still not 32 bits. Where are we going to get the extra 4 bits? And the answer is, they're going to go on the Bosch. The four most important bits are going to go with this 28-bit thing. And we get those top four bits from the current value of the program counter. That says whatever my highest four bits in my program counter are now, I'm going to go in that same range somewhere else, far away, but not impossibly far away. Right? So that means I can't jump. There's a certain range, a boundary, and I can't jump outside that unless I do something else. Okay. There's another way to get out of it. But it's a pretty big range, but it's not a full 32-bit jumping range. OK, so that's our little uh, instruction set, nine instructions. And the question is, where do we go from here? How do we get started to turn this into a, a processor's architecture? Um, but if you remember, we have steps, OK? We have steps. And so um, each instruction has some activity. We're going to start thinking about that and even modeling it with register transfer language. And off we go. Remember, ISA modeled as RTL is the way to figure out the data path requirement. So let's think about each instruction. The instruction specified by the PC is fetched and brought from memory. And then one or two registers are used. Depends if it's you know a two operand or a single operand one. Um, for example, add uses two for source, but load word only uses one for source. And then the ALU must be used to add or subtract or do something. And then after you've got the something, you store the results somewhere. Maybe you put it in memory or maybe you put it in a register. That's pretty much what every instruction has to do, isn't it? Is um, fetch it, get its operands, execute the instruction, and store the result back. Remember that? That's called the instruction cycle. It's called the instruction cycle. Fetch, decode, get operands, execute. Remember that? Yeah. OK. Every computer does that. And there we are again, the execution cycle. Come on. That's what we have to do for every instruction. So in a way, they're all alike. In a way, there'll be some differences in here. But in a way, they're all alike, because they all have to do something like that. All right, so let's <coughs> think about um, the general architecture needed to do any instruction. You've got a program counter, and its address is going to tell you what to get out of a memory called instruction memory. If I give address 0, whatever's stored here comes out. If I give the address that's 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, the last thing comes out. If I give the address that's 0 followed by all 1s, the one just before the halfway point will come out. Whatever I address with the PC going in, out comes my instruction, that particular 32-bit instruction. And of course, that 32-bit instruction looks like what we were just looking at here. It's got some fields. 
And the fields refer to various operands and the opcode and that sort of stuff. So you know, it might be good to take that instruction and send some of the fields to inputs to a thing called my register. So if I give the value 3 here, that says go get register 3. If I give the value 27 here, it says go get register 27's value. That's called operand fetch. Operands are not found here, unless they're immediate operands. Operands are found in registers or maybe in data memory, if it's a memory operand, except we don't have memory operands in MIPS, so our operands are going to be found here. Okay, what else? So possibly all three registers are needed if it's an R type. Remember, RS, RT, RD. Possibly just RS and RT are needed, not RD. Depends on the type of instruction. Okay, so from there, two source register values are going to come out, and I can do something in the ALU with them. For example, if it's a BEQ, and I'm asking for register 10 and register 11, here's the value of register 10, here's the value of register 11, and I want to know if they're equal. Anybody have a suggestion for what I should do in my ALU? Are they equal? What operation would tell me if they're equal? Subtract them and see if the result is zero. Yeah, that's a great idea, okay? What happens if I instead want to uh, <coughs> or them? Tell the ALU to or. What happens if I want to add them? Tell the ALU to add. Got it? Yeah, so the ALU is going to be doing the operations that we need for each individual instruction. They won't be the same ALU operation for all nine instructions. Of course not. But each instruction will need an ALU operation. Okay. If it's a memory operation, then the ALU takes what? The base register value, which I fetched out of here, and adds it to the immediate value, which is <coughs> not shown very well here, but you can see there's a branch that comes down here and it comes up to here, that's the immediate value, it adds them together, and so right here I have the memory address, the full memory address, RS plus the immediate part. Shall we go back and have a quick look at that? That might be helpful. Remember how memory addresses are formed? We take the RS value from the register, we add it to the immediate field offset, and that together is the address in memory that I want to read from or write to. So in that case, it means that the uh, ALU from memory is taking RS's value, here's the code for RS, if it's 3 or 12 or whatever, whichever one you want, and the immediate value, you tell the ALU to add, and right now you've got the memory address you want, give it to data memory. Got it? Instruction memory stores instructions, data memory stores data, and out comes the value that you're going to load into your register. So we need to be able to get it over here and <coughs> store it into the RT register's value. So in this case, that's a destination. It says where to load it. Or maybe you're not doing a load from data memory into register. Maybe you're doing a store from register into data memory. So that means that the value of RT that comes out here needs to say, hey, I'm waiting on the door. Where do you want me to load into? It's kind of like the moving truck comes to your house before you get there. And it asks the neighbors, hey, we got all this stuff. Where's the, you know, empty diary that we're supposed to move the new comb shoe into? And the neighbors go, new comb shoe? Oh, we didn't know. And so they sit out there on the street and wait till your car comes up. And then you say, oh, we're in diary 14. And you go up and they start hauling it up the stairs, right? You know, so the data has arrived. It's just waiting for the address to know who do I load into. So you give the address, give the data, and we do a write. That's our store word instruction. Okay, yeah, so you can see that with instruction memory, data memory, register memory, shall I call it? Yeah, it's a memory. Give addresses, get the thing. It's a, like a little memory. We call it a register file, if you remember that term from CS223. And one ALU, we can do any instruction that we want to do. We have the basic building blocks here for the data path. Now, we don't have any control yet. We haven't checked them all one by one and turned them into register transfer language and checked them, but we're going to. This is the beginning, though. This is the beginning of a data path. You got to have a PC to know which instruction you want. You got to send the pieces of the instruction to the places that they go. You got to fetch your source operands, either from register or from the instruction itself. You got to compute something with them. Maybe it's just an address. Maybe it's the final result. Look, if it's just A plus B, the result comes here. It's time to go back and be stored into the RT, R, RD register. So RS plus RT, please put the result in RD. 
So this will be the RS registers field to go there, the RT's register field to go here, our D will go there. So we can do with this simple hardware, one, two, three, four building blocks and a little register, we can do pretty much whatever we want. Okay. Any questions about the basic, basic, basic layout of a processor? Okay, now I haven't got any clocking on this yet. I haven't got control signals on it. Yes, of course, it's very Kaba. It's very primitive. We're going to build it up and make it nice. Let's take a 10-minute break now, and then when you come back, we'll continue to look at this in more detail. Thanks.